Hello, everyone, and welcome to the short version of Howling Coyote. And we have Brian and Joanna Lamboy talking about their fractal theory of being. And I'm going to challenge them to explain it quickly for those of you who have no time and want the five minute version. So, Brian and Joanna, take it away. All right, so we're going to start by sharing our screen. Let's jump to. All right, the fractal theory of being is best looked upon as not a revolutionary concept. We're just trying to put everything together in one succinct format for ways the people to look at themselves. So we all encounter multiple forces throughout our life. And we think that we could break up the different forces in these seven dimensions. So the seven dimensions are brain and body, right? Two different things. So technically there probably could be eight. You could definitely probably add culture into this. So it could be nine. It's not a set number, just we'll start with the brain and body, right? So you, you have your brain and body. And all of these different factors are influencing how you perceive the world, right? So if you have a certain IQ, say maybe super high IQ, like you're able to conceptualize things differently than someone potentially with a lower IQ. And if your body is out of homeostasis, let's say if you have super high glucose or your thyroid levels high or low, this is all impacting how you see the world in the moment just as personality is impacting how you see the world in the moment. There's different ways to look at personality, but we're all kind of on a bell curve of different factors of personality. I like to use the ocean mnemonic or the big five factor of the openness, agreeable, neurotic, um, extroverted, and consciousness. Um, so those are whatever wherever you are on the bell curve is a preset way for you to interact in the world or see the world. And based off your environment, you could potentially change maybe one standard deviation over, but you're, you're not going to get dramatic change over time. So that's another way that your perception impacts, or this is a factor that impact impacts your perception. Another thing is motive. The, what, what's your, what's your aim of the action that you're doing? So I like to use the analogy of, are you studying just to pass the test? Are you studying just to know, okay, they're going to test on A, B, and C. That's all I want to know. Or is your motive to study? I want to actually learn this information. If your motive is deeper and like you want to learn the information for the sake of learning it, you might, you're going to perceive different stimuli that you might not see if your motive was just to get A, B, and C, right? You might um, look at this YouTube video that's not on the test, but it, it helps you explain or delve into the topic further. And then friends and family is relatively straightforward. We all know that these impact how we see the world. Family is our predetermined or our first set of seeing how people act in the world. And, you know, we could act differently than our family. We could do the same. We could love their values, hate their values, but it's still our first set of values. It's the first set of way of seeing in the world. And then you t the concept of friends, that you're the average of the five people you hang out with the most, right? And it's a pretty cool concept. Like if you know a friend really well or your know, wife or family member that you could think as they would think or see the situation as they would see the situation. And that's cool. So now you can see how you would see it, but you know, Joanna might see it differently. So maybe I'll go somewhere in the middle. Then the actions in the world is basically what you do in your 24 hours of the day, 365 days in the year over time, right? So your actions in the world is going to shape how you perceive the world, right? So we want a surgeon to see 
the inside of the body different than the layman, right? That's is what we pay him the big bucks, right? We, every action that we do in that 24 cycle shapes our perception for the next day and we, and we grow and now we're seeing the world differently, right? Like architecture or, or an architect sees a building, he's seeing different things than I'm seeing. He's noticing different things than I'm noticing. And then the last thing we like to think about, which might not be intuitive, is the concept of your room. So it could be your bedroom if you're, you know, don't have, if you're living in your parents' house, or it could be your apartment, it could be your house, whatever is yours. If it's the concept of, okay, would I learn more if I just talk to this person? Or would I learn more if I was able to walk around their house, see what's on their bookshelf, see what's on everything without them cleaning up everything, right? Like you could tell a lot about a person, how they keep their room, right? Before they clean it up, right? So then you have these seven factors. And then these seven factors are being influenced or being, okay, I'll just back up. So we have your experiencing self and your remembering self. The experiencing self could be looked upon as those seven factors, right? So this is a beautiful chart. And I think this is worth the, the price of admission right here that you could see your a lifespan in months and see, see how quick time goes in the 90 year time period. So at any given moment, so say if you're at circle of that you're 18 years old, right? In that time period, your perception of an 18-year-old is hopefully different than your perception when you're 30, perception when you're 50, right? All of your life experiences shape your perception for that moment that you're at, that moment in time right now. And a cool concept that you could get with these, with this circle is that if you have a trauma or if you have some sort of event that you haven't incorporated, that you haven't really understood why it happened, you could think about it as a circle that becomes stuck. Now, that stuck circle influences all your rest of your circles throughout time. Now, when we get into the remembering self, we could talk about how you could potentially tell a different story of that circle or extract a different lesson from that circle to help you get more fluid. Because whenever we're in a situation and we feel confined, right? We feel restricted. Like that's not a pleasant experience. We want to be able to kind of like dance in the moment. We kind of want to be able to go with the flow, right? But if we have enough stuck moments, enough stuck circles based off your past experience, that will hinder you being able to move in the moment. So then you have your experiencing self. Then you have also you have your remembering self. Right. So there is there it's from this book where this person lost her memory and she literally had to question all of her acts of she didn't have any prior history of um, a memory and she had to tell a new story. Right. So she had the experiencing self, all these circles. But then one in one moment in time, she lost her story of the experiencing selves. And now she has to tell a new story. So what is a great concept of the fractal theory of being is the concept of stories and how important they are. So I'm going to tell a quick story about my Uncle Lou. So my Uncle Lou never goes to church, right? But his wife got into the choir at church. So he wanted to support her. So he goes to church with flowers and this person next to him starts to nod off. This elderly guy starts to nod off and hits into my Uncle Lou's shoulder. Uncle Lou looks at him and notices that he needs help. So he stands up and tells the father, like the priest, that, you know, we need, is there any, is there a doctor in the room? We need, this guy needs help. Eventually the guy snapped out of it. But when my Uncle Lou tells this story, he says, see, this is why I can never go to church. People die right next to me. Then someone else could look at this story and say, well, maybe it was great that you went to the church. Maybe you saved the guy. So the concept that you have a stimulus, you have the guy next to you, 
hitting into your shoulder. Now, depending on what your goal is, if your goal is to never go to the church, you're going to tell a story. See, I can never go to church because the person, people get unconscious when I'm next to them. But if you had a different goal as a goal of, well, maybe I should start going to church, you would have to tell yourself a different story. Now, the story can't be something that's not meaningful to you. Like it has to ha still have meaning, the new story that you tell. And that's the part of therapy, right? Creating a meaning enough story that could help you get to where your goal is. And that's another key concept is that you need to have a goal because if you don't have a goal, then from where, from point A to point B, there won't be a point B, right? Point B is the goal. So and we should probably stop there because we wanted a five minute. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So thank you so much for sharing that. <clears throat> and we'll stop there.